Welcome to Wolf's Watch. Today we have a special interview with a with someone who can help you find funding, find incentives for your business. We are pleased to have Marty Abbott with us. Marty has uh, he's one of the foremost experts in the country in state, county, and local incentives for uh, from government for corporations. There's a lot of pools of money, not just the 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 COVID funds that were publicized so well, but there's a lot of other long-term sustainable sources of help from local, state, and county governments. And as president and founder of the, um, I'm, and I'm reading, as you're watching this, making sure I get this right, uh, Incentive Management Group, Inc. He's president yeah. and founder of Incentive Management Group, Inc. Marty has 25 years of experience negotiating incentives for corporations to, to enhance the ROI of capital investments and also to increase skills within your company so that you can achieve your business goals. And it's hugely important. Uh, he's also negotiated large incentive packages over the years for companies such as, check this out, American Standard, Crane Company, Energizer, Hubble Inc., McCain Foods, Pactive, Train Air Conditioning, and many, many more. Over the years, he's met with many uh, state heads of economic development and governors of different states. Marty Abbott, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, you're welcome, Jeff. Not, not a problem. I mean, I'm going to enjoy this, I think. I hope so. I hope so. And as you're watching this, if you've got questions, this is live and interactive. If you're watching this live, get, put your questions in the comments and because we're watching the comment feed and we love to interact with you. If you are watching the replay, put your put your questions in the comments anyway, because we watch afterwards to see you know what you're asking and get your questions answered as well. So, uh, Marty, I want to start I'll dive right in with everything that happened with COVID, the the, the funds that were made available to businesses were so well publicized, unlike many of the other incentives that are available. Um, you know, it was, a, it was available for a wide range of businesses, but that's only short term. You know, what kinds of incentives are there for businesses going forward as the COVID incentives are starting to expire? There's two categories, uh, two big categories of incentives mm -hmm. for businesses. One is when you're growing a business, and the other is when you're uh, developing your people. Those are the two main categories. So employee growth is one and employee training is the other. Um, those are the two big ones. And the employee growth is the um, of the two of the two that I'm mentioning. Uh, employee growth is three to four times bigger. Three to four times bigger. That's that's um, really a huge emphasis on the employee growth. Yeah, the the, um, the training funds that are available within a state within most states are limited to a certain dollar amount that are budgeted every year. Um, and in most states, those funds are going to range anywhere from let's say small states two million dollars uh, all the way up to large states um, as high as fifty million dollars. Um, so. Uh, those funds are limited and they're budgeted every year. On the other hand, employee growth is unlimited in terms of funding oh. um, because what the states are doing, state, county, and local governments are doing is they're allowing the company that is um, causing the employee growth <laughs> to <coughs> participate in the additional tax revenues that are coming in to state, county, and local governments. So um, the, the term that's used in the industry is that that is um, foregone revenue by state, county, and local government. So let's say a project is, um, is started and that project is um, a manufacturing facility or some uh, service company is at being added to a local economy and 100 jobs are being placed into that economy what the state, county, and local governments are willing to do is to take the future stream of revenues that they'll enjoy from income taxes, property taxes, and so forth, and share those with the company that's causing that growth. So that's why the, the term foregone revenue, they're going to forego some revenue uh, on their part over maybe five or 10 years in order to give that money to the company up front, uh, a lot of it's up front, in order to give that money to get the um, the project for their local economy or their state economy, so they're really it's really reflecting their willingness to invest in the future, because they know that the, the companies that are 
investing in their people are bring are going to be contributing much more to their tax base and to the community at large. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, if, uh, you know, the, the way the, the governments are looking at it is that if we don't incentivize the company to come here by offering them 20 percent of the um, income that we could get if they come here, if we don't offer that incentive to them, maybe they'll just go someplace else and we'll never have any income. So rather get 80 percent of a number than zero percent of of uh, a very low number, nothing. Yes. Yeah. And I had, I had talked to a um, uh, head of economic development for uh, <clears throat> one of the, one of the cities in California. And there was a major corporation that was asking for bids to locate their, their new West coast headquarters in, from different cities where they wanted to locate. And yeah. their particular city was, was one that they were very interested in. And the, you know, they decided not to, reply because they felt that they they had so much they didn't get into the game they felt they had so much appeal to the company that it wasn't necessary and unfortunately that company and several thousand jobs went to a different city yeah was, yeah the company, companies, yeah companies can be uh, i mean when we're in a project the uh, company is taking a look at all of the factors economic factors that will determine their success and um, in the case that you just mentioned, if it turned out that locating in a very favorable environment for a company, such as a huge number of qualified workers, um, a very supportive government, not financially supportive, but uh, supportive in terms of permits and so forth. If that is the way the company is going to make the most money, they'll figure that out and they'll come out with an ROI on that project. And that will beat out a company that's willing to offer massive incentives, uh, a, a community or a, a, an economic area. Um, so so everybody's doing their own math. But in most cases, um, the government, the only support that the government is going to be able to give uh, is is the money, the share of mm -hmm. revenue that uh, that they're going to get. Um, and so that that economic uh, when we do a project, most of the time, the difference between locating in town A or town B or or or, or state A or state B in terms of the cost factors and so forth to the company are relatively minimal. They're going to need to be, for instance, in a um, in an in a, a suburb of a city in order to attract the kind of people that they need. So the cost of doing that in most states that they would be considering is going to be about the same. So what it comes down to is to a large extent, um, unless there's some unusual circumstances like shipping costs or something else, it comes down to what are the incentives that are going to be offered that is going to change the financial profile of the opportunity for the company. And one thing, anything related to, to government programs, and I guess this is because of my uh, aerospace days, I started my career out working for aerospace companies is a uh, concern I always have with government programs or, or anything doing working with the government is the blizzard of paperwork and, and the uh, sometimes complicated processes that go with that. I mean, how can, how do companies navigate that? I mean, it's almost especially all on its own to, under, to understand those processes and whatnot. How can companies navigate that without ending up adding you know, one or two full-time people just to deal with the paperwork in the process. Some of the very big companies um, will do what we do for most of our clients. We'll do it on their own and they will have um, a good sized staff that's capable of doing it. Um, one of the biggest uh, companies that was doing it on its own, and there aren't many that do it totally on its own, but let's say that there's this one example of a company that had five people um, full time um, working on government incentives and managing the government incentives. Um, for most people, for most companies, that's not going to be a possibility. They don't want to do that. They it, they don't really want to try and be expert in this field. And so, hiring somebody like ourselves is uh, something that makes a lot of sense. And most of the time, the other uh, consideration is that these projects, um, the flow of these projects within a single company is um, very um, inconsistent. 
uh, the workload is very inconsistent. So uh, it, when we work for our largest client, um, which is McCain Foods, um, I would say in some years um, we're working, you know, overtime to get the work done. In other years, we may be at 20 percent of uh, what we were in the highest work year. So you don't really want to staff internally for that kind of uh, uneven workflow. Sure, because it, it defocuses off of, of um, their core expertise of providing value, whatever that may be, product, uh, service to their customers. Yeah, yeah. And innovating sure. along those lines. Yeah. I'm curious, how did, how did you get involved with this type, with the incentives industry, with, with the developing a specialty in being able to negotiate incentives for companies? Yeah, this is something that you don't plan for, um, you <laughs> fall into. <laughs> um, I was working for American Standard um, and the uh, company had moved their world headquarters from New York City to New Jersey. They had had a discussion with the then governor of New Jersey and uh, she at the time, Chrissy Todd Whitman, said to them, I will <laughs> uh, give you an appropriate amount of incentives if you come to New Jersey. And so it was sort of a handshake deal. They came to New Jersey. She left office. She was, uh, she, I, I don't remember the circumstances, whether um, she was beaten in an election or whether she just uh, decided not to, uh, not to you know, continue with the governorship. But anyway, um, there was a new administration in. Um, the deal with her was a handshake deal. And I'm working for American Standard. They, um, uh, and I'm doing very odd, job projects. I work for the VP of government affairs and I'm extremely comfortable in ambiguity. So um, he would say, go to the Czech Republic and take care of this government issue that we have there and so forth. So he said to me, we have this uh, agreement with the um, state of New Jersey that if we move to the state of New Jersey, they'll give us $6 million worth of uh, cost offsets to, um, to incentivize us. But we have nothing in writing other than a very general letter and so he said, go down to the uh, state capitol and see what you can figure out. And, and basically the short story is that um, uh, successful $10 million later, I'm in a business that I didn't even, honestly, I did not know existed. Wow. And, wow. and um, American Standards got you know $10 million more in their pocket. Um, I've got uh, some really nice fees. Um, and they were paying me hourly. So, in fact, uh, I was paid to uh, learn this business and then perform in this business. Um, but it was a very successful in terms of the ROI for them. It was a very successful uh, you know, relationship that we had. We had that for four years until uh, people changed. There was a significant change in the management there and so forth. Mm -hmm. I'd like to shift gears a little bit yeah. and ask you about, you know, from from the president's perspective, from an entrepreneurial perspective, now you've built a company that now operates in, I think you'd mentioned at least 38 states. Right. So how, how has how did you succeed in building that? And I have a follow on about how your role changed as your yeah. company's grown. But how, how did you how did you go from that experience? to now having a, a, a truly an interstate successful business? Sure. The first five years approximately were really learning fundamentals. Um, you know, who do you talk to? What do you say? Um, and beginning to put into place uh, procedures and processes um, so that you didn't have to think about what you were going to do. Um, we also played around with a lot of different pricing strategies back then. Um, so, um, so that was the, the first five years. And then um, after that, we started to um, try and determine who are the best clients for us and work through that process. Um, you know, who's, what's the right target audience to go after? Um, and then um, we started to um, figure out pricing strategies. Um, and we ran into the 2009 recession, Ooh. Uh, the Great Recession and so forth. And, yeah. and we had to totally revise our pricing uh, to be more based upon performance than based upon services provided. We were basically a, here's what we'll do for you in the next year. 
and here's what you'll pay us regardless of the result. Um, and, and we got into that because we had relationships in the beginning with um, individuals who were in a corporate structure where they could say, you know, I know Marty Abbott and he's going to perform for us. So we don't really mm -hmm. have to worry about the outcome. Um, but then as, as uh, the economy tanked and uh, people were saying, we're paying these guys this kind of money and there's no guarantee, uh, then we had to basically go to performance pricing. And over about four or five years, we modified our pricing so that uh, we modified it very slowly so we could stay in business. Um, because if we if we went from where we were to the pricing structure we have now, um, we would have been out of business. We had, would have had, you know, no to low, very low revenue for a couple of years. Sure. That's a huge shift. Yeah. So, uh, so let me let me ask a quick question about that. So you mentioned the, the gap in revenue. So th there's that reflects the, the cycle times in, in working with the government programs to be able to negotiate and, and complete and bring in the actual yes. incentive revenue. Yes, um, it's it's a combination of cycle times and the um, nature of uh, incentives, which are always performance based. So, um, OK, uh, let's say a major project is uh, is going to happen in two years. The company is going to build a new facility and they're going to build it two years out. So we're starting right now and we're saying to state, county, and local governments, um, give us your best offer to incentivize the company to do that here, do that in your state, your, your, your local area. Um, we put those in place over a period of six months, let's say. Um, the company then makes a decision to, um, to site in one state or the other. Um, and then they start the construction period. And almost nothing happens during the construction period in most instances. And then uh, they start hiring people. The, the facility is built. They start hiring people. And the incentives will generally, most of the incentives will flow in over five years. So that's sort of the, you know, time period in which, um, uh, so we're getting, we're getting some money uh, in our pricing structure to do the work to put in place the incentives. We're mm -hmm. getting some money um, in our pricing structure to successfully have those incentives in place and the company agreeing to them. So the company knows they've locked in these incentives. They know what the ROI is going to be. They make their decision on where the site, where to site the business. They make their decision based upon the uh, incentives. In many instances, uh, somebody will be somebody else from uh, the standpoint of the ROI of the incentives. And then uh, two thirds of the incentives actually occur in terms of our fees as the incentives come in. So it could be over a period of five years. In some cases, it's as long as 15 years, but usually it's oh, wow. five, five to 10 years. Yeah. So that, that's a that's a very risky shift in, in your revenue model. Yeah. To go to performance based then, especially yeah. with such a long up to 15 years. My gosh, such a long, yeah, would, uh, long tail on the revenue. Yeah, I would say the majority of uh, the incentives are within a five to 10 year period of time. So as quickly as five years, as long as 10 years, there are a few states where the um, where the rev, where the uh, incentives come in after that. But it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's it's not the majority by any means. Sure. And, you know, and finding that's a great innovation in response to what happened in the marketplace during the, the Great Recession. And, you know, finding some way to guarantee results, guarantee work is a huge issue with with service providers yeah there's one thing to have a product and say hey you know here's a warning on a product here's what we can guarantee about the product in a service relationship because there, there's work that needs to happen on both sides that's always it's always fascinates me to see how uh companies and how entrepreneurs like yourself are able to innovate and finding a way to look here we'll guarantee our work here's how we're going to do that one of the things that we have uh, formularized is uh, what to expect on the revenue stream on the back, what's called the back end of our revenue stream. So that's 60% of our fees that we get when the company performs what it promised to do in terms of adding jobs, mm -hmm. investing and so forth. That 60% um, never, never is 100% realized. And identifying over time what that was, you know, what that ended up 
being or what that would be uh, is, you know, is the way you manage your revenue and your costs and so forth. So, you know, we might say on a project where we got a certain level of incentives that we were going to have $100,000 a year coming in uh, over a five year period of time. But that would be the maximum amount. In fact, when most companies uh, go through the process, let's say it's 60 percent of that that was really going to occur. So mm -hmm. our fees as a percentage of that, we can pretty well predict now on an average basis. Obviously, some companies will do really poorly performing against the uh, goals that were set and, and therefore the incentives that they receive and other companies will do fairly well. But we've got a pretty good pretty good handle now on being able to predict those outcomes from a cash flow standpoint. Yes, yes. Knowing your numbers and applying some sophisticated analysis to them. You know, yeah. It, we're, you know, we're a, um, I, I, by nature, am a very, um, linear person, uh, from the standpoint of, you know, that's uh, my, my core. I love numbers and I love trying to figure out things that are numbers related and so forth. And so formularizing the business so that you are predicting the outcome, uh, years mm -hmm. in advance is, is, is pretty important. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I wanted to, to also ask, because you mentioned the you know, first five years or about uh, your comment was, you know, getting the fundamentals down is making notes. Yeah, you're yeah. Listening. As you're watching this, have something to write with. You want to make notes. Uh, first five years are about the fundamentals. As your company continued to has continued to grow, has your role changed as the president and founder or how sure. you think about how you think about your role in yeah. running the company? Yeah, I think there. I, I, I'd say there may be three phases, maybe four phases. So in the first few years, you're basically learning the fundamentals of the business. I mean, you're learning the, you know, unless you come into something where you're really the expert, um, when you get into something like this, you're learning all of the fundamentals um, of the craft of doing this business. And then you're after that, you're working on sales uh, and and you're working on the service side of the business. Um, and then you move into a period of time in which you're um, you're at least for me now, the past uh, few years have been really very focused on on revenue. And I've hired people who can handle and I can teach them and they can handle the uh, service side of the business doing the work um, and now the, the the focus really is on um, finding really good people and determining what is the formula for really scaling the business um, you know we have been a business a small business um, in and in this business this business of incentives and tax credits and all of that kind of stuff um, there are not a lot of companies who have a, a bigger than 15 people uh, presence in the marketplace. It's it's a lot of small entrepreneurs and, and small companies. And so the question is, how do you scale up and um, uh, and how do you really you know grow the business? We I think most of what we um, have achieved to date is understanding if you were in a manufacturing environment, it's uh, we have all the right machines. We've we've now figured that, that out. We've got all of the right people in place and we have the specs for the people. Um, you know, we know how to operate everything. We know what the numbers look like and, and what the accounting should be in order to make sure that you're um, going to end up with a profit at the end of the year and so forth. And now the question is, how do we scale this thing? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, how do we really make it big? Do we add more equipment? Do we add more square footage? Can we put another shift in? Yeah, it's actually, um, it's, it's really relates to revenue. Um, doing the business uh, in five years, um, maybe I'm oversimplifying, but in five years, I probably learned 70 to 90% of what it takes to do the work. That's not the that's not the really hard part in most businesses. I don't think the hard part is getting the work to be done, getting the work from from clients. You know, how do you acquire uh, business? How do you um, how do you go from a really small company uh, with small clients to a big company with big clients or a small a big company with a lot of small clients? It depends on your marketplace. Um, 
and that's really um, that's the hard part. The hard I don't think the hard part is making the widgets. Um, that you can learn relatively quickly. It's um, you know how do you go out into the marketplace and sell the widgets? Who do you sell them to? And and how do you um, you know how do you really do that and scale it every year? Um, a lot of entrepreneurs in this business will uh, be satisfied with, uh, paying the mortgage. Um, mm -hmm. and the, the, once you've done that enough, or once you've done that, or you've believed that you've got that down, then the question, if you want to continue to have fun in the business is, you know, how do you really scale this thing? You know, how do you grow it at 15% a year consistently? Um, and, um, and, you know, Almost nobody needs the money that comes from successfully doing that, but it's the challenge of doing that that's the fun. Mm -hmm. Well, and it well, creates and it a creates lot of opportunities, right? It creates opportunities for the people that are being hired. Yeah, the, yeah. You know, the, the yeah. economic benefit to the communities that those companies are doing business in. Yeah, for sure. And, and on a selfish basis, it creates the opportunity for succession planning. Yes. Um, you know, for bigger time, time off and, and, uh, you know, for basically, you know, deciding the fun things that, uh, come from being successful. Play more golf, more time with the family. Yeah. But both, both. Yeah. I'm trying to do more, more of both of those. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I understand that you, uh, how did you put it? You play, a, uh, more than a little bit of golf. <laughs> um, that has varied, but is, it is, uh, I used to play a lot of golf. Mm -hmm. I got to be pretty good. My lowest handicap was seven, which is not bad for a sometime, you know, would be golfer. Um, and, and then, um, we moved and I had to stop, um, playing golf a lot because the country club that I was uh, belonged to was a half an hour in good driving and an hour and a half in bad driving. So, um, so I stopped playing golf for a long period of time and I've just been getting back to it and, um, I really can enjoy it now. Good, good. That's part, that's part of what makes entrepreneurial life worth it, right? It's the challenge of being able to build the business and then also being able to enjoy some of those benefits. Yeah. No, you know, family and, and hobbies and activities. For sure. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. And, and, uh, and feeling like you've got, uh, everything in place from the standpoint of the formulas of how your business runs to the people who are key to making that happen um, in a way that you don't have to be present. Uh, you don't have to be um, as involved and you have choices at that point in time. Yes. I, I, I always remember listening to a, a gentleman, a successful entrepreneur, and he was telling the story of the first time that he went on vacation and came back and found that sales had actually grown and things had gone well, <laughs> which is a good thing. But he said, you know, the, the, the challenge that I had with that was I wasn't really sure how to feel about that. It's what I wanted intellectually, but in, in my heart, it's like going, but do they need me anymore? <laughs> yeah. 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 So there, there's a, there, there's a big um, emotional transition with some of those phases as well when, when leading your company. Yeah, I think that I think if you ever get to that point, then the question becomes, what is the next challenge? Mm -hmm. you know, that they, they don't need me is is a wonderful thing. Um, and then the question becomes, where do you want to go with with the satisfaction you get out of your your business? Um, do you want to grow it in a different direction? Do you want to start something that's adjacent to it? You know, what are the opportunities that come out of that? Um, yeah, so that that's a tremendous, um, you know. I would love to take a long vacation and come back and see that this was uh, working just fine. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Boss, please go take another vacation. We're yeah, exactly. <laughs> then, then, you know. Speak, speaking of vacation and, yeah. and, and golf, it reminds me of uh, something we were talking about pre-show a little bit. You're, you're in an area where that's been affected by the recent uh, hurricane and weather that that's that that has stirred up. How, how have you been doing with that? We were lucky because we, um, you know, hurricanes and weather are arbitrary and um, mm -hmm. 
I remember we were, so we were, we were spared uh, geographically where we are. And I, by mean geographically, I mean, within a mile radius of where we were, everything was fine here. A lot of water and so forth and so on, but nothing, no permanent damage. Um, oh, good. But, uh, you know, um, the, the weather is so arbitrary. My wife and I were about to buy a house a number of years ago in, uh, in Greenwich, Connecticut, where we lived for a long time. And um, it was in what's called back country. So away from where most of the civilization is, it was near the airport. And um, we had, uh, we had a tornado come through, which was very unusual oh. in, the north, in the Northeast, very unusual yeah. and a significant tornado. And we were probably a month from when we would have made a commitment on the property. It was not selling fast. It was a big piece of property. It was, as I say, in back country. So you had to spend 15 minutes to get to town, which in this part of the country is, you know, a long period of time. And it was near the airport. So there are a lot of factors to consider. And the tornado that came through went right through the property and took a swath of trees out about 75, 100 feet wide and just scarred, wow. the, scarred the property. Mm. So, um, you know, so we were spared here during the most recent storm. It's a long way of answering your question. Um, and uh, some neighbors, maybe a mile away, uh, you know, had to really, you know, bail out their basement and uh, cut some trees down and do a lot of things like that. Mm. It's incredible. And I grew up in the Midwest, so I completely understand about the tornadoes. And you're right. That's very, so rare. Yeah. Um, because we used to, when we go through tornado season, um, <clears throat> if it was a bad year and a tornado hit, sometimes we'd, we'd tour some of the, uh, some of the neighborhoods near us that got hit when we didn't. And, you know, it would just be, it'd be on, Unbelievable. You see two houses. I remember as a, as a kid seeing uh, where a funnel cloud had gone between two houses and like ripped both of them in half, didn't touch anything across the street. Yeah. It's just, yeah. It, it could be so capricious. And to see that kind of damage a mile away, but yet your local community was safe. It, it's, it's great news. And it's just always uh, a reminder of how, you know, how sort of close stuff can get. It's sort of analogous to life in general. I mean, right. It, right. Life is very arbitrary. Uh, you know, we attribute a lot to people and their intention and their hard work. But in fact, um, there's a lot of luck involved or a lot of just avoiding, you know, big problems that's involved in being successful. Yes. Well, and, and as you demonstrated during the Great Recession, being able to stay attuned from a business perspective, being able to stay attuned to what your, your customer needs are and adapt to that. Yeah. As opposed to just is just writing it out as many businesses do. During during a recession in the 1990s, I watched a uh, acquaintance of mine build his business out in the construction industry when most companies were either folding up or hunkering down. And even he even went against his board of advisors, which was very rare. Mm -hmm. And when the economy turned around, their business just exploded. You know, like he's like you pointed out, he didn't do anything unreasonable. He didn't risk the business but he went against the grain of the conventional thinking yeah, yeah. and was set really well when, uh, when the, the general economy picked back up. One of the things that we've done in the last five years, which is um, from a pricing standpoint and from a, how we adjusted to the, um, to the recession and learnings that came out of that and so forth is we actually offer now our analysis and recommendations at no cost. Um, mm. which is, I mean, which is where all of the value is, <laughs> mm -hmm. but we basically say to our customers, if you sign our agreement and you have to understand that there's reasonable payments that you'll make over time. Um, and we, we have to obviously go through and explain how, why those are reasonable and when they occur and, and so forth and so on. But if you'll do that, we will come to you and uh, we will present all of the greatest ideas that we can. We'll tell you how specifically to go about getting the incentives. What's the best way to negotiate these? How many different sites do we have to look at? We'll go through all of that, make those recommendations to you at no cost. Only then if you're satisfied that the recommendation makes sense from your standpoint, do you need to pull the trigger and start paying us money? 
Mm. Um, and and that's a, that's been a tremendous business getter um, because it, it almost eliminates the risk. Now, the one thing that you have to do is you have to commit to us because if we make good recommendations and for some reason or other, you don't want to use us, but we're capable of doing the work, you got to use us. <laughs> um, that never sure. happens. Ne ne never an issue in, in that regard. But uh, um, it's a great pricing strategy um, to give away, quote unquote, all of the goods, 90 percent of. I was just thinking that it's like 90 percent of the value up front. You're, you're yeah. giving them practically a master's degree education yep. in, in what's available. Yeah. and how to go about accessing it. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, we, we, we lay out things like, you know, what programs uh, are available in each state, county and local government, um, what uh, the requirements are to successfully apply, what the requirements are to successfully manage that over time, what are the reporting requirements, who else has taken advantage of these programs and what's the, what are the dollars that they have gotten in terms of incentives mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, a number of other factors that basically lay out in extreme detail what the company is accepting when they when they say to us, OK, go forward. And then we have a plan that we have to deliver on um, and the company has to deliver on in terms of their investments and so forth. Um, and then the outcome is pretty much assured as opposed to going in and saying, um, you know, I'll charge you five thousand dollars a month and I'll go out and see what there's available for you. Um, you know, that's, it's, that's not, uh, in a way there are a lot of people who do that, but, uh, but that's not how you're going to get the most business. Mm -hmm. But, and, and that works in terms of from, from the client side, being able to access incentives like that is, is, is viable even for, as you'd mentioned in the majority of companies or 15 employees, 15 employees or less that works for small as well as midsize and large companies. Um, not sure what your question is. Your, your is your question. Yeah, the, that was, uh, I apologize. That was kind of a word salad. It's uh, <laughs> in, in terms of being able to identify incentives for uh, the smaller companies as well as midsize and larger yeah. companies. Yeah. So it, it's the same process. Um, okay. Let's say a company comes to us and they're five people right now and they want to grow to be 50 people. And their plan is over the next five years to execute that and to add 15 jobs a year or whatever um, until they get to 50 people. And uh, they know what the salaries are going to be or what the wages are going to be and so forth. Um, the process is pretty much the same. We will come back to them and we will say on the basis of the work we've done, the research we've done in your state and in your county and in your local government in terms of the history of incentives. Here's what we can tell you is a uh, plan for us to go out and get incentives for you. And here's the dollars that you'll get or the tax credits okay. that you'll get or whatever. Um, it, you don't the the minimum size uh, in terms of jobs to be added that will qualify almost anybody for getting incentives is 25 over three years. So add. Okay. Eight, eight plus jobs a year for three years and we can get you some money. Um, and uh, and the, the, the nice thing about the small projects is they can happen very fast because it's very formulaic. So if you come to us and you say, OK, um, I've got three months before I want to launch my business, um, I'm going to have 25 people added over the next three years and their salary is going to be X and I'm going to cite them in this location, so forth and so on. Um, within three months, we'll have all of those projects. You know, we'll have all the financials worked out in terms of what we're going to get, when we're going to get it, how it will impact the company and so forth and so on. Um, the, the bigger companies and bigger projects are going to take a little bit longer, um, but the small ones, because the state, county and local governments will say, oh yeah, that's one of those small projects. Okay, fine. Here's the, it's very formulaic at that level. Um, and there's not a lot of negotiating. There's not a lot of upside or a lot of downside. It's, you know, here's the package, you know, so it's pretty straightforward. That, that's pleasantly surprising because that's way smaller in terms of growth than I would, would have thought. And the fact that, that it is, it has been made somewhat routine so that for companies that qualify, it's like, yeah, here we can move fast. That's always a pleasant surprise with anything yeah. related to government. 
Yeah. And I, I don't mean that so much as, as a, a dig on government. It's just that there's, there's processes that need to be followed and, and procedures and whatnot to make sure everything's done appropriately based on what the government's offering so they can make sure that they're not misstepping. Um, th that's great to hear. I mean, that opens up a lot of options, I think, to entrepreneurs that otherwise wouldn't have realized yeah, it takes, that they could access that. It took me the five years to basically learn how to do that in such a mm -hmm. way that, um, you know, that it, it can happen in that period of time. What do you have to serve up to them? How do you have to serve it up? Um, you know, what are the steps that you have to take in terms of introducing people, not introducing people? Um, what documents do you have to provide? All of those kinds of things you have to. You know, the first time out, um, I'm sure I stumbled and the first time out, I was being paid by American Standard, going back to what happened in the very beginning. I was being paid by them on an hourly basis. Uh, I was a consultant. They were just paying me on an hourly basis so I could make a lot of mistakes. Um, and so and I did make a lot of mistakes, but my approach wasn't I have to be perfect first time out. Of, you know, So over time, I uh, figured out how I had to be perfect in terms of spending the least amount of time to get the best value for the customer um, because my fees are going to be based as they are today on um, a percentage of what the customer is going to get one what my clients going to get in terms of incentives uh, i don't have any fixed fees anymore where i can charge a certain dollar amount on a monthly basis mm -hmm. yeah, marty i'm watching the time and yeah. i promised that we were going we're running over from what I had promised you, and I want to be respectful of your time. And as you're watching this, we don't want to run too long either, uh, because we're just scratching the surface and we could go for hours. Yeah, absolutely. It, so uh, it, it's clear that that brings so much value to the table and helps entrepreneurs access um, funding incentives that they, they probably didn't realize. I, I certainly didn't, you know, th that it would be possible for their level of growth, especially when they're hitting that point that they're, they're starting to scale up. Um, to, to bring yeah, that to the table just as a, a a ballpark way to think about things if um if you're spending a uh, hundred dollars you mm -hmm. should expect that you're going to be able to get incentives that are between five and twenty dollars to offset that cost and that that hundred dollars could be a service business where you're spending money on people plus mm -hmm. maybe a little bit of rent or it could be a manufacturing operation at the um at the 5% level, it's probably a service business, but on a manufacturing operation because uh, the money that's being spent by the manufacturer is going to be around for 20 years. So it's guaranteed long-term revenue for state, county, and local governments, and they're going to pay more for that. But if, you're, if your business plan has a investment in the first year to three years of $100, you need to write a line in saying incentives from state, county, and local governments somewhere between five and $20 is going to be my cost reduction on all of that above. That's a huge help. Yeah. Huge it, help. It is a huge help, especially, yeah, most people, you know, it's an afterthought for most people. Um, and, but it is something that, you know, you should be planning uh, to put into the PL as soon as you're beginning to develop that PL and you, you know, you ought to be thinking, you know, I'll put in that ballpark. Maybe I'll start off with 5% and then I'll hire somebody like Marty and his crew and then figure out what I really should be uh, putting in there. But mm -hmm. uh, when you, a lot of uh, small companies, uh, entrepreneurial companies, before they go to investors, um, really need to be doing this um, because it can dramatically impact the ROI of the uh, business plan that you put together. Yes. Well, as, as we saw with the temporary COVID funds. Yeah. Some of these government funds are just, uh, you know, they they can be very impactful to a business plan. Mm -hmm. Indeed. So, Marty, what's the best way to uh, for entrepreneurs to get in touch with you to learn more about how you can help their company and, and what incentives may be available to them? They can uh, they can go to our website. They can um, the easiest thing to do is just call me on the phone. Um, yeah, that's the uh, the website address that you've got there, and um, you know, my, uh, my phone, I don't know whether my phone number is on the website or not. Um, but, uh, it's easy enough when you get to the website, to figure out how to get to me. I think my phone number or maybe the company phone number is there for sure. Um, okay. 
but the other thing is to go to LinkedIn and send me a message through LinkedIn. Um, yes, which is how we met. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I probably um, ninety five percent of uh, inquiries come through LinkedIn. We have a huge marketing campaign through LinkedIn, um, and and that's the reason why most of our inquiries come through LinkedIn. Okay, excellent. And see, that's another potential potential conversation right there is how you're effectively leveraging LinkedIn to help build your business. We'll we save that for another time. We spent three, three or four years perfecting that, and uh, now wow. there's a steady stream of uh, mm -hmm. you know of inquiries come in. Hey, I enjoyed it. I appreciate uh, the opportunity you've given me. Good. Thank you so much for for being with us today. This is Marty Abbott. He is the president and founder of Incentive Management Group. And as an entrepreneur, there are incentives beyond the COVID incentives, which are starting to expire. There are incentives available for you from your state, local, and uh, county government that will help you under right circumstances uh, help help you with building your business, with scaling your business up. And Marty is the one of the leading authorities in the U.S. on being able to access those. He does business in multiple states, so they're they're probably working in your state. Reach out to Marty to learn more. Marty, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, it was great to be here. Thanks for uh, all of your time and interest. And thank you for watching Wolf's Watch. I'm Wolf, and I will see you on the trail. <laughs>